Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful Melissa Barrera to talk all about her Netflix series, Keep Breathing. And the first thing I wanted to ask about was, was your character development process, because throughout the course of the series, there's so many backstory elements, some of which you get to play to in terms of a previous relationship, her relationship with her father and her home life, um, but also there being so many facets from her childhood as well, which really create who this character is in the present. I was interested in how that informed and enhanced your character to development process in building her out, having so many rich details to pull from? It was definitely the most well-written script that I've ever encountered. It was so rich and it almost like even because there's so many moments of silence in, in the show, but in the script, everything was so detailed and written out. And so it was like reading a novel really when I, when I read. So it felt like going in to play a character that I have a book to study. So it was, it was beautiful to have so much to draw from because I have so much information about her and then just filling in certain like little gaps and adding a little bit of personality here and there that I brought to the character, but really, there was so much on the page that I'm so grateful because it was such a hard job that I'm just glad that they made that a little bit easier for me. <laughs> and I love that you're bringing up there just how many scenes there are for you to play, you know, without a scene partner, how many moments of silence there are in your performance. Because like you said, that contextualization of character is always there in all of them. Um, and I was interested in with what you were just saying about there being so much detail in the script. Did that also just help in terms of finding the pacing of a lot of those scenes? You know, how long am I going to hold on this moment while she's going through these various things with having so much detail in the script? Well, actually, I feel like I had, it almost felt like I had too much time to do everything because they would sometimes be like, okay, we're going to roll, just try and build a shelter, go. And they would like roll for like 10, 15 minutes on me trying to build something. And obviously not all of it ends up being in the show, but it really felt like they were letting me live like truthfully in the moments and and, you know, be silent and contemplating and just being with Liv's thoughts and sometimes the moments of stillness that are so real, but we rarely get to see on screen because people are the execs of like studios and stuff are always like, keep it interesting, keep it moving. But like, this is life, you know, life sometimes has moments where we're just still and speechless and just like being and breathing. And so, I got, I feel very spoiled because in this show, in the shooting of this show, I got all the time in the world to do a lot of stuff. I was rarely told like, can you hurry it up? Like, it was just kind of like letting me feel things out. That's amazing. And, and also, you know, throughout the series, there's so many different emotional undertakings of how she's responding to the situation that she's ended up in. And I was interested in with the fact that one of the very first things that happens in the show is that she sees someone die right in front of her. For you, how that influenced in and affected the stakes of where she is emotionally from the very beginning. And if you felt like there was still some deniability of the situation, like would be there as a survival instinct or if because of that, it was much more real for her right from the get go. Um, that moment at the end of the first episode is, is big because for me, it represented a breaking point. Liv is a person that goes through life with this shield on and, you know, very professional, very, you know, work oriented. She's a workhorse. She is kind of antisocial. She doesn't have time to, you know, go out with the coworkers and all of that because she'd rather not. She'd rather be working and she'd rather just like keep moving forward, keep moving forward all the time. And she's constantly with, she has this mask on, right? And up until that moment, I think she was keeping it together because there was still one other person with her. And in that moment where that person leaves her, it's like the mask just like shatters from her face and there's, and there's so much hurt and fear and anger and frustration that it literally just in a second kind of hits her. 
And so we see for the first time emotion, you know, like we see her kind of break in that moment and then come to terms with the fact that like she's fucked, you know, like what is she going to do by herself here? And she was on a timeline, you know, like she's a planner. She, she has schedules. She had this plan. She was going to get to Anubic and now what, you know? And, and so I think that, that seeing that moment is an indicator of like, oh, now we get an unfiltered version of her in the present because she has no one to play up, you know, anything for she's alone. And we get to see in the flashbacks, how she is in life, how she interacts with people, how she interacts with her family, with her coworkers, with her love interests and, and what led her to be that way. Cause we get to see her as a kid, which I think is beautiful. It is. And, and like you were saying, she is someone that, that is more comfortable spending time by herself and, and very much in solitude. And did you view an aspect like that as actually being something that helps her when she's in this situation? Because all of a sudden she has nobody around her. And so there's actually an aspect of that that she's already comfortable with. It's not, oh, I, I need other people to be having conversation and dialogue. It's more the problem solving and everything else at hand. Um, so were there certain things that that maybe don't serve her as well in the real world, world that you felt were attributes in this setting I think so I think I think she like I said she's a mover and so instead of like getting depressed and like spending an entire day just like laying on the beach and waiting for help she's like okay I gotta build a shelter I got she's a problem solver so she you know still in this situation she's trying to get distracted to avoid going into those places in her brain where she's having to remember all these painful things that, that, you know, she's messed up in one way or another, like all the relationships in her life, she's playing back those moments of like, uh, why did I react like that? Why was I mean to him? Why was, why did I shut the door on my dad? You know, like all of these regrets that come back. And in terms of the physical aspects of, of the show, that it's incredibly physical in terms of the performance that it asks of you. Um, and so I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the water work and the water training that you did, um, you know, even in getting scuba certified before going into this role. But then even the fact that the lake that you were filming on was frozen until just before you filmed. So you had to even acclimatize and get used to cold water work as well. Um, and so what were some of the facets that you found in your character from going through that training once you came in? into filming? Um, I, I love having to learn a new skill for something. So getting, getting to train in, in the water to prepare for those scenes was very exciting for me. And I feel I'm very similar to live in that we like challenges, I think, and we, and we like working hard for things. And so having to get certified for scuba, which, you know, I should say, I didn't actually get my certification because I failed my final test. I could never clear my mask underwater, take it off and put it back on. I never managed to do that because every, every time I thought I was going to drown. Like I just couldn't literally impossible. I did everything else. I did all the hours. I did the test, everything, but technically you have to get through all the skills. And that one skill kept me from getting my certification. Which is, you know what, it's fine because I realize that I'm not a scuba person. I'm not meant to be underwater. I, it's fine with me. I enjoyed it and I'm glad that I did it, but I'm not ever gonna, it's not a hobby that I'm going to pursue. So I'm okay. But, um, but I had to do that in Catalina Island, which is freezing water, um, no visibility. It's not the best place. It's not the most beautiful place to go and scuba dive. So I was just terrified and I had to do it in two days. I only had two days to, to do my water stuff. And that whole, that whole, you know, timeline kind of had me in a panic. And so the entire time I was panicking and I was just channeling, like live in the water. This is probably what she's going to be feeling like. Um, drowning and that fear of not being able to get out and all of that like I can't I can't even imagine one of my biggest fears is drowning so doing all of those underwater scenes as fun as it was because it's the most fun that I've ever had on set and the most fulfilling you know feeling was also the most terrifying because I legit thought that I could die 
And I, of course I wasn't going to, I, we had an incredible stunt water team that was there, you know, five or six people all around ready to like go in and grab me and save me. But it still is terrifying, you know, like to, to feel like you can't, you're holding your breath and that you're not going to be able to make it out. is just terrifying. It was hard. It was hard to do, but it was also super fun. Are there challenges that come as well with doing that sort of particular stunt work that is so meticulously detailed? Where, like you said, you know, even every breath you take has to be really measured and thought out alongside making sure that you're still servicing the character in every moment as well. So it's not just about executing the stunt at hand. It's about telling the audience more about your character. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because like you're having to think, you know, I have to hold my breath for this. I have to, you know, perform certain actions. I have to like act out a scene, but my brain is just thinking, don't die, don't die, don't die, don't die. You know, like just <laughs> hold your breath and the nerves also like make, make you not be able to hold your breath as long as you normally can. There's a bunch of things like extra things that you have to worry about. So then you're like, oh, I have to act too underwater and I can't see anything. So you're pretending to see, even though people that like are divers know that you can't see anything without goggles. But in movies and TV, we pretend that people can see perfectly underwater for some reason, but you can't see anything. Like it's just a blur. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lot of uh it's a lot of like panicky. The good thing is that like most of the time that I'm underwater. I'm panicked, like Liv is panicked. So, you know, I would come out and Maggie, our director would be like, can't believe like you're acting, like it's incredible. And I'm like half acting, half really terrified, panicking and it's all just coming out. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a, an experience that I loved having. And I hope that I get to do more of because I want to get more comfortable with that kind of stuff. But also I loved it. It was like thrilling, like the adrenaline of like doing those kinds of things. And it was just fun to do tank work. I'd never done that before. And you also were doing numerous pieces of, of stunt work on dry land as well. Um, what were some of the most intrinsic elements of, of that? Because again, that involved really extensive wire training before you were on set as well. Yeah, <clears throat> it was, it was super fun. I felt being up on the wires for the first time, I was like, I just could stay up here forever. I was like, oh, I want to, I want to do an action movie. Or I want to do a superhero movie now. Cause I love this. And, and our, our son coordinator was like, I've been doing this for a while and no one has stayed as long up on the wires as you have, because it's uncomfortable. Like if you know, you have the harness and it's like tight and, and I was, they would yell cut and I'd be like, flipping backwards, forwards, just like enjoying my time. I was, I was having a ball. Um, and it was, there wasn't, there wasn't a, as, as much training for that as there was for the water stuff. Um, because, you know, in, in, I didn't have to do like crazy stuff in the wires. I, I had to like fall. There's a, a big fall that happens that I just had to basically fall, you know, like they would just drop me and I'd be like, you know, it wasn't like I had to hold my balance or anything like that. So it was, it was fun. It was a great little taste of, of that, that I, that I feel like I could do more of, and I want to. And, and obviously with all of these different physical elements and ramifications that, that happen throughout the series, that changes the physicality of the movement of the character and, and the performance that you're giving scene by scene, episode by episode, because obviously, you know, if she's had this giant fall, you know, what has that done to her body? How is she now walking? You know, is she able to walk properly at the same time? Um, and so how did you set about navigating the different physical aspects of, of making sure that you were always looking at what's happened to her body in this really short period of time, but what are the impacts that that's going to have and how I'm going to move accordingly? I am probably the most annoying actor that any script he has ever worked with because I am constantly like, wait, what just happened? Okay. And if that happened, then that means that this, it affected this. And sometimes like directs are just like, 
don't think about it that much. Like just fucking do it. And I'm like, no, but it has to feel real. So, it, and, and then that would mean that like my back hurts and then, but also like my leg. So which leg, uh, and how, how much of a limp, like, should we, cause she has to still walk a lot. Like I'm always like over analyzing every single thing because I, I am the kind of spectator that always notices like breaks in continuity, emotional, physical, whatever it is. I'm the person that notices them. So I want to make sure that I don't have any errors like that in my performances. So I'm very OCD about continuity in every aspect. And, and uh, I always, yeah. And, and I'm always like asking all the questions and like overanalyzing everything and over rationalizing and making sure that everything feels real and the effects of like any accident or anything like that are seen. Like I, I would have a scrape on my, like I fell through a tree. I would definitely have scrapes on my face and they're and the makeup artists are like, okay, fine. We'll give you scrapes. You know, like I'm that kind of person. And, you know, with that in mind as well, did the emotional trajectory and, and the space that she's in, in that regard for you, was it very hand in hand with the physical and kind of like, if something's happened to her physically, this is what it's going to do to her emotionally. Yes. Um, it, it was all, uh, it was, it's funny because I feel like it's, it's, uh, a, a deterioration physically, but, a strengthening emotionally because she has to push past more obstacles, more, you know, uh, more physical ailings as the show goes on. So her mind has to become stronger, even though it feels like it's becoming weaker because she's, you know, hallucinating and all and having a fever dream and getting physically weaker, but her mind is going stronger. So I've always think about it as like an X, you know, like the, the, as, as she, as her body deteriorates, her mind become stronger. Yeah. And, and with those elements in her mind as well, it's interesting because like you said, there's her mind is going through this journey of becoming much stronger. And at the same time, she's facing a lot of insecurities and vulnerabilities and going through all of that. So it's very much in tandem with one another. Um, and so how did you kind of strike finding that balance in a lot of scenes where you're bringing both of those elements forward? It's like, she can still be really strong in this moment, but she can also be insecure about something that she's reflecting on from her childhood at the same time. Yeah, it's, uh, it was, every scene was like a roller coaster. There was, it wasn't like nothing felt linear in the show. It all kind of felt like, uh, like, like popcorn popping of like, all of a sudden this thought comes through and it, and it affects whatever she's doing. And all of a sudden she remembers this thing that like halts her journey or like confuses her, you know, like it's, it was um, challenging in that sense, but also, I don't know, I feel like I, I read the script so many times that I, I was super clear, like going in, I knew her journey so well already because I had read the script so many times and I, I just fell right into it. I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain, but maybe being out in nature helped me to just feel like I was her and, and like put myself in her shoes. And it just, I was also trying to not to be as honest as I could be in the way that, that I would react to a lot of like uh, triggers and stuff like that, because I didn't want it to feel because I'm alone that I had to like overact or over explain or over, you know, show anything. I just wanted it to feel real. And I trusted that somehow my eyes were, would tell the story. And because I felt her so deeply, I think that that comes through also, of course, you know, editing helps a lot in the way that, you know, the story is told, but I, I was just very, um, very wary of, of a lot of things. And like my own insecurities came afloat of like, oh my God, are people going to get sick of my face? They're only, they're going to be stuck with me for six episodes. And like, I don't know if this is going to work, you know, like those kinds of thoughts also came to my 
mind in the middle of it. So I was just like using every single thing that came to my mind um, and, and like pouring it into live and everything that she was feeling. I love that that point that you're making though about your performance, because there's no one that she's creating a reaction or or response to. It is just about her. Um, And was that part of the reasoning why a lot of the lines are kind of delivered very softly and very quietly as well, because she's having a conversation and a dialogue with herself. She's not talking to anyone else there unless she's really kind of raising her voice just to unleash frustration and anger in a moment. Yeah. Um, That was, that was a, one of the challenges too, figuring out when she talks out loud to herself, how that happens, because I don't talk to myself out loud too much personally in my life. Whenever I do, it's because I like hit my toe in the corner of the you know shelf and I'm like cursing or something, or when I like mess up and I'm like, Oh, this really, but it's usually like to myself, you know? So we tried it a bunch of different ways and what felt more, natural to me was that kind of like soft whisper because really I'm not projecting for anyone you know I'm just like saying it to myself so it's more like a uh, kind of it feels like it's kind of like exercising your voice to not lose it in that moment that's how I, I felt live sometimes I was like she literally just wants to talk because if she doesn't say something today she won't say anything And so sometimes that's how, that's how I would justify her saying things out loud. I was like, you can lose your voice. If you don't lose your voice for like a month, then like you could lose it. You could like be hoarse, you know, you need to, it's a muscle that needs exercising. So sometimes I feel like that's how I would avoid myself from feeling like ridiculous saying certain, certain things out loud. Cause sometimes I'd turn to Maggie and Brendan and I'd be like, why is she saying this out loud? Can't we just like somehow tell this story another way? Cause I feel so ridiculous. And until I found the way that she talks to herself, then I was like, okay, I got it. I, I, I understand now. Yeah. And there are also moments where she's talking to, you know, hallucinations or people that she's seeing in her mind as well. And, and it starts out with one of the guys that was in the crash as well. And she just completely ignores him and doesn't respond to anything for a really long time. And so for you, what did you feel like the shift in the character was that all of a sudden she starts engaging with him and then it opens up into being other people that she's having conversations with as well? Um, what, that, that particular character that, that she manifests, um, I always thought of as uh, an, a version of herself that she tries to distance herself from so that it's not her talking down to herself. You know, it's not her being self-deprecating. It's someone else and who, like, you know, the last person that she saw is a, an easy person to go to. Um, and I, I feel like because there's all these fears of, she has a lot of fears and that's the answers that she's seeking, you know, like who, is there something wrong with her? Is she like one of her parents? Like, does she have the same um, disease or not? And so this manifestation is basically all of her fears, you know, coming to her and, and ignoring that is kind of like, refusing to accept that that's even a possibility because she's hopeless, you know, like she's just like trying to figure out if there's any way that she can survive this. And then I think the acknowledgement comes when she has a plan. So she feels a little bit better about herself. She feels a little bit like I'm not completely lost and I, and I have just one up to you. So I can acknowledge you now because I'm, I'm above you right now because I am the one that's leading this charge, not you. Yeah. And one of the elements with her problem solving that felt very realistic is she's not trying to solve everything all at once. It's not, okay, I need to get food. I need to get water. I need to build a shelter all at the same time. It's this compartmentalization of if I can achieve this one thing, then this is a success and then we can do the next thing. Um, And so did you really see it as like this character just like taking a lot of tiny steps versus trying to solve the insurmountable in front of her? Yeah, I did. And that would sometimes stress me out because I'd be like, oh, like there's so many hours in the day. If she's waking up on day, like with the sun, because obviously, 
and like going to bed with the, when the sun goes down, there's so many hours that you could be doing so much, but that's like my rational Melissa brain thinking. I think for someone that's so completely overwhelmed, it makes sense that you would, you would go like baby steps, you know, like, okay, what's the, the most urgent thing that I need right now? Shelter. Okay. Let's do that. And then once, once she finishes the little food that she has, she needs to eat eventually. And so what's that, you know? And, and, and I feel like, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, I think it's, it's also very true to her, but like, you know, a very like organized kind of person that, that goes, makes lists for everything that she does and all of that. So she's going like, okay, check mark for this check mark for that one at a time. And until she completes one thing, she doesn't move on to the next. And one of the moments as well that I wanted to ask you a little bit about is, you know, the the show has all these flashbacks throughout. And then there's a moment where once she's kind of reached more of this space of, of having these, these fever dreams, as you were describing them earlier, um, everything kind of collides together in flashback where, She's in a flashback in her workplace, but there's elements from her relationship with her mother, with her relationship with her dad from her childhood, and even down to like her wearing clothes that she's wearing in the wilderness. So it's really all these different times and spaces of this character, but all in this one moment. And so as opposed to the other flashbacks, how did you approach going into a scene like that and figuring out what what does the tone of this particular moment need to be given everything that's happened and that there's elements based in reality, but also so much of this is what's happening in her mind. That was, um, I think it, it helped a lot that we got, like the, the show is divided in, in two halves, the first three episodes and the second three episodes. And, and, the, and the second half is when it gets, it starts getting like super trippy and like everything starts kind of like mixing and, and, and getting like confusing. We don't know where she's at, when she's at, which, what's reality and what was, what's, you know, a figment of her imagination in like her delirium, but it helped that we got a new director and a new photographer, a new DP for the second half. So they came on with a fresh take and a new, like, we have a lot of scenes that kind of happen in both the first half and the second half. And usually when you're shooting a show, you kind of shoot one thing and if you see it again in the second half it's already been shot and they just reuse it and we would shoot everything again with the vision of the other director and so it would be two completely different things and that's and and that's when i started really uh understanding and and figuring out that i could pretty much do whatever i wanted in this and it would be okay so i started playing a lot with her emotions and her confusion and her anger coming out more and all of these things that made it much more fun for me in, in like the second half of the, of the, of the show, because I was like, this could be played this way, but what if I go like totally opposite and I, and I, you know, it's a dream dreams don't make sense. And sometimes we do things in our dreams that you're like, I would never ever in life do that. Why did I say that? Or what, you know, and and that's what I wanted to really come across. I wanted to see that like weird, like very um, manic, also, you know, a, a version of her that she's afraid to show to that she's afraid of becoming and that I wanted that to come out a little bit more. Yeah, no, it really did come out in those moments. And it's a really, really impressive performance with everything that you've had to do in terms of the emotional trajectory, as well as the physical elements. So congratulations on everything with the series. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.